Hello again, everybody, and uh, welcome back to a writer's desk. Um, I hope you're staying healthy and well, and we still can't get a haircut, you, you can see, and I haven't played tennis for nearly two months, although I am playing tomorrow on a private court in England. My club is in Wales, I can't play there, but I found an alternative. More importantly, those are trivial concerns, thousands of families have lost lo loved ones. Who's to blame? Is anyone to blame? My next guest, Scottish novelist Ewan Har Morrison, author of seven novels, is convinced that the totalitarian, na totalitarian nature of China's government meant that the truth about the virus was suppressed early on with fatal consequences. Ewan's latest novel, Nina X, which won Scotland's most prestigious literary award last year, the Saltier Prize, picks up the theme of authoritarianism in fictional form. Based on real events, it tells the story of a girl imprisoned in a Maoist cult in London, whose leader kept her and other women trapped for more than 20 years. Welcome, Ewan. Hi, Simon, how are you? Good. I could do with a haircut, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Can you just share with us where you're speaking from? Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from a little house uh, out on Loch Long in Scotland, um, which is, is very idyllic. Uh, it's also the, uh, we're just a mile down the road from the major nuclear base um, for, for, for the Western world, where the, where the nuclear submarines come in and, and change over their, their uh, nuclear weapons, the warheads. It's a bit like the, the uh, the place in Thunderbirds, the TV series, where the mountain opens up and then um, the subs come in. That's Faslane, right? So there's Faslane and this coal port. So we're 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 halfway between the two. But it's a it's a beautiful idyllic lock for about um, twenty three hours a day, and then you know we have military activity for for the other hour. It's perfect. You have for special military. passes to get in and out. <laughs> Not quite, but very good roads though because of the. Of the military patrols or anything. Of course. So, how are you coping with lockdown? Is it a good time to write? Well, it's it's a, it is a good time to write. Um, if you can, as a writer, I think uh, as a mature writer, anyway, part of the battle of writing is to try to deal with the pointlessness and meaninglessness of what you're doing every day. You know, you, you often come across, or I do at least. The, the question of what the hell am I doing this for? You know, who am I doing this for? Who even bloody cares? Who will care in a hundred years? Who will care in five years? Who will care in three months? So if you can, if you can beat that demon, um, then the coronavirus situation is, it's a, it's a similar sort of problem, you know, to deal with because we don't know what the future is going to be for the publishing industry, for example. Um, it's been thrown into chaos really. Um, we don't know what's happening to the books that were supposed to be published this year, other than they're being kicked down the road. Um, so, yeah, there's all this free time, um, um, which is great for creativity and setting your own deadlines. But the whole the demon of meaninglessness does raise its head from time to time. Other people have said, you know, that, yes, you've got all the time in the world, more than ever. Um, but you've got this sort of white noise of fear and worry and in the background that takes away from whatever productivity you might have. Oh, for sure, for sure. I think as, as the fear in summer um, of actually catching the disease slightly, slightly comes down, the greater fear comes up of the long-term economic damage that, that's, been, that's been done to the world. And this is, really what's, this is really what we're starting to look at. I mean, can we really have every country in the world with a trillion in, just in debt hanging over us and is every country in the world just going to sit there and go well we're going to you know pay back our own central bank over the next 50 years and um, it seems to me a, a, a ludicrous and heavily punitive um, set of restraints that we might be walking into so that's that's the main thing I'm worried about my kids and my kids kids I'm worried about the industries that we work in uh, primarily at the moment after having taken quite stringent measures to make sure that everyone in the family was safe. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, your course in Scotland, slightly different to where I'm speaking from in, mm. in England. Mm. We follow the news, we see Miss Sturgeon. 
I get the impression from here that they're doing rather better. They're, they're, they're behind in terms of opening lockdown, but we get the impression that they've done slightly better than, than the English, British. Scotland has done better, but I think we have to, to remember that Scotland has the population of London, but spread over a geographical area that's the size of England. Right. So, so you know, there's something like five people for every meter in London. Uh, and we've got about a mile and a half each between us uh, in Scotland, if you were to look at the whole landmass. Mm. So, so, you know, Scotland's quite socially distanced in itself, apart from the clusters around Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, you know, also, you know, there's less, uh, in many ways, Scotland is not so intensely, you know, focused on its, on its centres of money making, uh, like, like England is with London. So there's not really a great magnet for people um, within Scotland that would bring so them in. there's less talk about you know Trumpy and talk about hmm. it's the economy that's got to open up. Well, we're not really talking about the economy just now because the economy is shot because it's 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 oil and tourism, oil tourism and whiskey. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe whiskey will do fine uh, with all the increase in alcoholism that's 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 probably happening already. Hmm. Um, with I know you didn't want to talk about independence, but just one question. No, I'm not you... going to talk about independence. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm really not. All right. That's funny. I thought I might just sort of slide one in, but all mm. right, let's move on to the sort of uh, the meat of the uh, meat and two, potato, two veg of this uh, mm. interview with your desk. Let's have a look. We've got some pictures. I, would technical... say I, can't, I can't actually show you my desk because my, my good wife is actually, uh, uh, she's at the desk just now. We're, we're, we're hot desking in a small space. About... Oh, okay. Well, we've got a picture of it anyway. That was on a very good day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, it's an it's a, it's a old-fashioned wooden desk or table? Yeah. or Yeah, it's actually a desk that we found in the street. We used to do quite a bit of street combing when we were, when we were young people. Um, we once actually found a desk on Halloween. Not this desk, but another desk. I was dressed as the ghost of Kurt Cobain and my wife was dressed as Batwoman. Yeah. And we came across this wonderful writing desk in the middle of the street and we said, hold on, just halt Halloween. Let's just grab the desk and take it home, uh, which we did. It's now, it's, now a, a, it's now a writing desk. You carried it home? We did, yep. That's very funny, that's a great story. Um, so I'm looking at it and I'm seeing you're obviously a laptop writer. Yeah, yeah. I, yes, I, and, a, and a paper writer as well. Okay. I do tend to, you know, do a lot of work on the page and then I have to find ways to do transcribing and adapting and so that I'm never faced with the blank page as such. Um, I always have to feel like, kid myself on that all I'm doing is simply moving from one format to another. So I'm, I'm moving from a notepad to phone to a laptop to another um, you know, larger format, or I'm changing it from first person to third person or whatever. And a lot of, a lot of the writing happens when I'm doing that. So you're a novelist, fiction, no research as such, or, or not, well, some research, I'm sure. Some research. Some you mean do I do? You mean do do I do a lot of research? Yeah. Oh yeah, I did. I, I did <laughs> always tons of research. Oh. Um, for example, on the book Nina X, which is about the girl who's kept in captivity by a Maoist cult, I did tons of research into the history of Maoism, the history of the new Soviet man, which was a project to create um, a kind of purified human subject. Who, was, who, who would not say or think anything that was capitalistic, who would only uh, think and believe in, in communistic things, uh, speak in communist language as such. And that's really the story of Nina X. It's, it's about a girl who's, who's raised to be the new Soviet man, but she's raised in a vacuum in a, a, a very small group that becomes cult-like. Mm. And in a sense, she's the sort of um, the manifestation of, of one of the great communist ambitions since mm. Lenin. Lenin that actually came up with the idea of the new, new uh, Soviet man. Um, and Mao, Chairman Mao, uh, who led the Chinese Cultural Revolution, uh, the Chinese Revolution um, from the 40s onwards, 
um, he he was the first to really try to manifest the new Soviet man, uh, which which involves controlling language and behavior. So there's a lot of a lot of academic and historic research on that as well, and they came up with some really horrific suppressed information as well about the Chinese Communist Party, um, the number of deaths, for example, in the in the uh, in the famine um, during the Great Leap Forward, uh, the the uh, the annihilation of, uh, of the four pests in the four pests project, the killing of birds that then led to, uh, sort of the mass killing of birds that then led to, you know, basically plagues of locusts the next year that decimated right. crops. So a lot of the, a lot of things I learned about the early days of the Chinese Communist Party have, have huge repercussions for the way that the Chinese Communist Party behaves today. Right. It's, it's inherited some of the same problems that it had then. Namely, communist structures have a. Well, we're going to we're going to get onto that in a moment. Sure. Let's just stay with how where you work and <laughs> how you work. Um, we got another picture, I think, of the view. Yeah. Um, which is a beautiful, beautiful view. Hard to think that you know. So one writer I spoke to the other day, he said he makes sure he doesn't have anything to look at. No pictures on the wall, nothing mm -hmm. behind him. So he, all he can see is his computer screen, but. You've got a ravishing view, not a distraction. Not really, but I, I guess the older I get, the more I tend to think about big, um, big things, transcendence, life, death, whatever. I can't help but look at that and think, you know, we're we're utterly um, small, and uh, we've got a very tiny time um, to be alive and to try to do anything. I mean, it's, it's it's a glacial landscape, basically. It's shaped, shaped by millions of years. It's quite austere and sort of romantically Scottish in that sense. It's a bit of the sublime about it. But um, I, I, I find it quite meditative and quite serious. I don't, it's not so much a landscape that, that I um, want to hang around in, you know, with um, some canopies and, and uh, a T-shirt. It's more, it's, it's more, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dark place. It's a bit Caspar David Friedrich. It is, isn't it? Yes. I'm glad you think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what about your work rhythm, your so-called process? Are you a morning guy or a night owl or both? Or Well, my wife is a scriptwriter and she's very much a morning person. And when she first met me, I was absolutely a night person. Um, so we've had to, through a process of abrasive living together and working together, we've managed to work ourselves down into some meeting point, which is almost a nine to five. Um, but we started off, Emily would get up at five in the morning and start working and, and she'd be done at one o'clock when I'd be getting up and, and, and writing then till four in the morning. So, so we've, we've, re, we've readapted and met in the middle so we can actually see each other. So you get up, have a cup of coffee, take the dog for a walk and then set to? That's it, it's a really, I think the more regimented a writing life is, um, the more, the less distractions there are, um, yeah. the easier it is to get into the frame of mind where you can, you can explore, and you're not you're not limited at all to the context that you're in. Um, Graham Greene famously wrote 500 words every day for about 40 years, and then had a huge uh, G and T. What's your target, or don't you have one? Um, I tend to try to pinpoint a big goal or a big question that I have to answer. It's more, so it's almost a bit like the writing methods, more like writing an essay, but in fictional form. So I have to answer a question for myself. Each day. I have to answer bits of the question, but there's a, there's a much bigger question that's, that surrounds the whole book. So it's not so much to do with word count, because I know that when I'm really on track, I can, I can do a couple of thousand words in a day, but then um, there are days when I'll have very little because I'll have to do a lot more research or I'll just you know I'll have a bad day um ideally when we get to a situation you know like Stephen King as well where you you know you do your, your um, you do your six pages and um, it's something to maybe aspire towards but it's definitely not the way that I work mm. so far we've had a question come in how do you your wife is a screen Hollywood screenwriter how do you work in the same house? Do you chat between your offices or is there a do not disturb sign on, on, the, on the door? Also, do, you, do they read each other's work and discuss their writing with each other? 
Well, that's a good point. We do read each other's work. In fact, I just read some of Emily's new script last night. We were rolling about laughing because it's it's very it's very light and funny and 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 really ironic. Um, so that was the introduction. She'll go off and write the whole script now. I won't see anything more of that until it's done. Um, I'm a bit more secretive and paranoid myself, so uh, I'll probably let her see something when it's completely finished. Um, in terms of the daily thing, there's communication problems when two people are in the writer's bubble. So we sort of have like 30 seconds together at lunch and then we go back, back to our little monastic cells and, and you know continue to do what we're doing. So we really see each other first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Um, you know, dinner and a bit of Netflix or something. Um, but attempting to communicate when two people are in the bubble is impossible. Uh, you, you just have to say, stop, you've spoken to me for five minutes. I, I've taken in one word, dog, that's all I know. It's like, let's restart. Either I'm gonna stop everything I'm doing and we'll, you can tell me what you want or we'll just put this off for four hours. <laughs> it's very interesting. We had novelist Simon Van Boy on yesterday who suffers from ADHD a bit anyway and so his writing is is the doors shut and nobody can come in and he says you know i'm so easily distracted that if somebody disturbs me it's like i've been knocked off the horse and it takes me ages the horse runs away and it takes mm -hmm. me ages to get back on that horse and start again yeah no i think i think for example when social media first really took off um, there's a year around about 2014 where you know things started getting really multimedia on social media and I, I, I kind of want to send Facebook an, an invoice for, for, for the amount of time I spent on that damn thing when I could have been writing books you know it's my face lost to Facebook year yeah. basically. Um, so you um, do a lot of tweeting you have a whole a fascinating series of mostly it's a uh, art isn't it Fi uh, painting yeah. photography it's art, a little bit of philosophy, just things that are sort of interesting me at any at any given time. Um, theme that's become fascinating is is lost artists, forgotten artists, and right. and the lives of artists. Um, we were taught in art school to just look at the art and never talk about the lives of artists. But when you look into just brief little synopsis, you find so many artists died young or died poor or mm -hmm. um, had really rather tragic lives. So I tend to collate little museums of four images with a little blurb about a, an artist or a philosopher and, and right so did you have a you went to art school did you i did yeah yeah oh so you have an art background rather than how yeah. did you transition from art to literature i just see it as part of the same thing really um I, art was becoming very dominated by postmodernism when oh. i was in art school so so utterly anti-art you know, the postmodern mindset in art is you don't represent anything. You don't express yourself. What you do is you deconstruct the apparatus of, um, you know, Western society, whatever. Um, so that's that's no fun, really. Um, so I just had to get out of that. It's it's no fun and it's, it's also incredibly nihilistic. Um, and uh, so really a lot of really talented artists getting sucked into that whole postmodern void, if you like. And I just had to get out. I, I, I just wanted to be someone who did express themselves and did, you know, explore real themes and ideas and believed in beauty and truth and all the things you're not allowed to believe in in art schools anymore. Another question, what's the painting behind you on the wall? It's an interesting one. It's my wife's very, um, very painterly photograph. There you go. Oh great! Of the lock. It's a it's a lock. It's a just got two little kids on it there. You see the little kid? It's like a Terence Malick, isn't it? Like a Terence like yeah, David. it is, or, or like a Banksy. Days of Heaven sort of thing. Um, Days of Heaven, yeah, beautiful. Emily's, of Emily's, Emily's an amazing photographer. All around us, we've got lots of little collages and things that are that are we've hmm. been making over the years, and great. lots of junk. <laughs> Right, last question about your desk. What does a desk mean to you? I always ask that and get fascinating different replies. What does a desk mean to me? Um, well, um, yesterday Simon Van Boy said it's his fortress. Really? Um, I don't know because I've had so many desks. I think probably a screen is more my fortress. Um, um, I probably never worked out the 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 optimum desk to have. It's always been a make do thing, but I'm, I'm very insistent that I have my desktop the way it needs to be. And that is my fortress of all my files that I'm working on.
mm -hmm. folders. They've got a hierarchy of in progress. And the other side is maybe in progress one day and along the top is in progress now. So um, in my chaotic youth, um, I used to feel the only place that I really was in control of my world was at my, at a, well, it was writing, mm -hmm. desk or not. It, does that relate? Do you relate to that feeling? Mm, not really, because I can um, to steal from one of the great philosophers. Um, never trust the thought that does not come to one when walk <laughs> unless walking. Um, Frederick Nietzsche used to used to go for his walks and have some of his biggest ideas, and and I always marvel at how um, a bit of time away from the desk uh, can actually be where you do the really important. Yeah work and it can be just a, like a light bulb going on yeah. a simple a simple overview um i guess us scots have this terrible tradition of you know calvinism and and like hard work so maybe the desk is seen as a kind of punitive place you know mm -hmm. the scottish school desk so maybe i've resisted the the idea of the scottish school desk where you're going to nail yourself to the ground and leave when you only when you've got an education um so um no, for me, the laptop's better because, you know, I move it around. <laughs> Great. So um, you've written extensively, your new book is about a, a Maoist cult, and you've written extensively about cults. What fascinates you about that subject? And is there a personal background at all? Yeah, 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 there is. Um, we have a family history with quite a bit of trauma within it, down the generations and also um, religion. It was a great break with the Christian religion and my uh, with my father um, and he got bandied about into what we would now call would not, uh, totalist or or cult cultic um, groups beliefs I did the same uh, in as much as I needed a, a really powerful belief system in my 90, in my 20s and you grew up in a sort of cult well, I well, it wasn't so much a cult, but I did grow up very much within the hippie ethos and within um, strange goings on in our in our house. Strange, strange hippies from all over the world would come and stay with us. Um, there would be you know, weird, weird parties that would sometimes involve drugs or degrees of nudity and all that. It wasn't that people were worshipping anything in particular. They were all mostly escapees. So I was you know, one of these kids who, who kind of escaped a dreadful hippie childhood. Um, uh, did it turn you off against the 60s? Oh, very much. I loathe the 60s. Um, I love the 60s. Loathe the 60s. And, and, and Bob Dylan, <laughs> Joni Mitchell, who, you know, abandoned her own child to go off and, and find herself. If you dig beneath the surface as well, as I found, there's not... There's not um, there's not a big gap between Woodstock and Charles Manson. <laughs> no, no, really. Um, the, the totalitarian thinking and the cult-like um, thing is actually embedded through the whole hippie thing, through the sort of back to nature thing, through the idea of, of, of um, you know, the wild person free in nature. Um, it's a very dangerous set of ideas because it sets you against civilization and against society. Um, anyway, I, I, I grew up seeing a lot of hippies were drawn into these kind of cult-like mindsets, whether they were new age or hardcore um, left-wing stuff that my dad got himself involved in as well. Um, he was in fact involved with a group who were terrorists at one point. Um, only in a dreamy hippie sort of way, you know, but um, he was... He Did was, you ever reconcile with him? Oh, yeah, kind of, kind of. I mean, he was the absolute nutcase and I loved him dearly. Um, but I, I guess he's sort of passed on this, this uh, I've inherited this, this bug, this problem where, where you had a, a, a huge religious faith in the family. And then that with him, it became the hippie escape from religion. And it became extreme politics as well. And so I, I was the child of both those things. And I had to sort out why is the people have to live for their beliefs? What's so powerful about having something to believe in? Um, so, uh, and I became a communist in my 20s, you know, to try to solve that. Um, and 
the work I've been doing recently is really been looking at um, it's a legacy of, of of belief in things like communism. Right, which brings me to my next question, because you've been very active on Twitter, as I mentioned in the intro, criticizing the Chinese government's handling the corona up mm. epidemic. Can you just outline uh, the main thrust of your argument? You know, why was this a particularly ghastly thing to happen in that society? Well, I think and does it relate to cults, because there is a connection, isn't there? Um, ah, there is a connection that the connection is totalist thinking, totalist, right. um, which is slightly bigger than totalitarian. Mm -hmm. So in a in a totalist society um, run from the top with a single party like you have under the Communist Party of China, there's no way of, of, of talking up to your bosses. You can't say this is going wrong. Um, you know, we need to do something about it. There's no feedback system. Um, mm. So this increases accidents and it, it also increases lies and cover-ups. If you go way back to the, the actual famine in China under Mao, it's a similar, mm -hmm. it's a similar situation. History is repeating itself. What you have had then was um, a, set of, a set of accidents and unfortunate things, a series of miscalculations and then a massive cover up, which then made things considerably worse mm -hmm. for everyone. So really the problem is the Chinese cover up that's gone on, whether this began in a wet market that, that, uh, that trades in, in animals that, the, that are even subsidized by the communist party, that the wild animal trade is subsidized by the communist party, whether it came from the wet market or it came from um, one of the viruses stored in the laboratories mm -hmm. in Wuhan. You've got this massive cover up on a lot of different levels to do with suppressing media, suppressing journalists, influencing the World Health Organization. And it's to do with the, the totalist structure that they have within um, communist China. So it was a famous case of that doctor, wasn't that? Who was then rehabilitated? Well, you. Sort of. Yeah, we'll have to wonder about this, this rehabilitation business. I mean, it happens very, very, very quickly that, that um, anyone who opposes the, the uh, communist state apparatus suddenly gets wheeled out, um, you know, to say, I was wrong, I take it all back. Or, you know, or, you know and using this very extreme language, which we're, we're, we're quite unfamiliar with in the West. Um, you know, I think we've been quite naive, really, um, about our dealings with communist China. We've, we've, we've enjoyed all of the free stuff that we've got, all the cheap stuff, all the cheap clothes we're probably all wearing. Um, we've enjoyed them buying up all of our debt, um, but you know, it comes with a price. They're not, they're not a democratic country and they're not gonna be held accountable for this. Right, there's, a bit, there's quite a debate both here and in the uh, United States. It tends to be on the right of the political Mm. spectrum that you know post coronavirus we cannot go on with so-called business as normal with this country china do you think that will be a consequence well i think i think that i think that will be i think that will be a consequence um but at the same time we have to it's just not that simple mm. um because there's so much because china owns so much western debt and china is a big big bully Right. You just have to see the way that they managed to exert a tiny little bit of influence and that report on the cover up and which was commissioned by the EU, one of the yeah. committees there was it was almost entirely redacted. Um, so, you know, Trump might like to boast that we're, you know, we're not going to have anything more to do with China sort of thing, but it's going to be very hard to extricate ourselves from that. All right, let's move away from politics. We're almost out of time, you and want to know what what we can expect to buy in a bookshop from you well next year the year after hmm that's a good one um meaning what are you working on now? no indeed no indeed well well this thing i've I always have two things i'm working on at the same time so oh, I have, no, that's interesting I have, why I have, hmm? why that is i i just have to bounce ideas because i tend to have too many ideas i i, I have to sort of use a filtration process if I just keep working with everything I've got, then I tend to overpack a book. I have to have like a filter so I can filter stuff off to book two. Maybe book two will never come into existence, but it keeps book one focused. 
Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, I've got um, I've got a book I'm really pretty obsessed with, which is as um, it's about a, a man who's mourning his daughter, um, and uh, he starts to hear her voice in his head all the time, um, and uh, it's it starts off as a as a as a gentle and generous voice, mm. and it uh, begins to take on a more sinister. Um, tone as as uh, it leads him towards suicide or worse. Wow. So it's a kind of dialogue between a person and their and their own mourning, if you like. Um, Interesting. So we're nearly out of time. We had a question in from Hazel. At what point do you feel? Let's not spend too long on this, but give a quick answer. At what point do you feel that politics and political activism becomes totalist? Hmm, it can actually start off totalist. I think when people start controlling the language that they themselves speak and the language that other people are allowed to speak, that's absolutely totalist. One of the definitions of totalism is the control of language. You know, uh, we, we see this in political correctness writ large. Um, so the self-censorship on the one hand, and on the other hand, there's, the, there's just not permitting other people to, uh, to use certain words or, or banning of certain people from speaking. So these are totalist ideologies. I mean, basically a totalist ideology says we will start from a blank slate and we'll get rid of all of the bad words and all the bad people. Hmm. And we'll, we'll, we'll control everything that passes through our filter. So all the words and all the images will only be what we want it to be. And you, know, right. and you get that in cults and you get that in totali totalitarian um, Great. Nations. Great. We've got one more. Ollie asked a question. Would you consider delving into historical eras in your new books? History has lots of cults. Ha, I've been digging into early Christianity just now. You see, one of the things is I find it really hard to write historical fiction, but I do love the ideas that are embedded within history. History is absolutely full of cults. I give a TED talk. Um, pretty much on the history of utopianism and cults and utopia are, are absolutely intermeshed. Mm. Uh, you can probably find that um, on, on YouTube. I've never been able to, you know, to write within an historic mode. Maybe I'll do that when I'm 70 or something, but I steal ideas or explore ideas from the, um, from history. Um, very interesting to know that a lot of uh, what um, we call communism today really really was kicking about in cult form in, in the in the 1600s mm, um, anabaptists etc we have to, to, be, yes. to be continued we've run out of time sadly we've reached the end of this fascinating interview and ewan's reminded us once again why we need particularly now writers voices give us perspective and a long overview and um, we've got an eclectic list of other authors coming up, including American author Karen Carbo and a British historian, Katie Hickman. And before I end, I also wanted to point you in the direction of a fun fundraiser for the Society of Authors, uh, which is a, it's a hardship grant scheme. You know, most of the writers probably uh, on here, the reason to be successful, that's where they're on here. Um, but there's a lot of writers that really struggle and are doubly struggling now. And so the Society of Authors is uh, giving money away. They've given two, they've got 200, they've given 600,000 away. They've got 200 more applicants that they need to raise money for. So you'll find a link to this scheme at the bottom of our Facebook, Writers Desk Facebook page. You can give a bit or even better, give a lot if you love books you love reading and you're enjoying this uh, series but for the moment it's thank you to you and morris and fascinating thank you simon Cheers, thank mate. you stay well and goodbye Cheers. everyone and see you on monday bye for now